you know, for the final presentation before we break for tea and coffee, and Ian Spring from um, Corrosion Prevention Limited tonight uh, is going to talk to you about marine structures, which is very topical since we're in Portsmouth today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, glad to see that the header slide on there has actually got my name on it because mine's got my colleague's name. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so he's handed the baton over to me. That's, uh, that's good, so that's quite clear. Um, my name's Ian Spring, it says I'm from Corrosion Prevention Limited. We're an independent corrosion specialist designer, um, primarily in cathodic protection for marine structures and reinforced concrete structures. So, uh, the topic. My topic this morning is principally for marine structures, so we're going to be looking at uh, corrosion in marine structures, uh, particularly this uh, phenomenon of accelerated low water corrosion, an introduction to um, different systems and different approaches for cathodic protection to be applied to marine structures, um, and as, as Paul this morning briefly mentioned, galvanic anodes and impressed current systems, uh, with some project examples. That initial section will mainly be for steel in seawater structures, so not concrete structures. And then after that, we'll look at some uh, reinforced concrete structures in the marine environment, application of CP, and some case studies. So, corrosion, Paul gave you a very good introduction to all things corrosion this morning. Slightly less, slightly, slightly less sciencey, but generally, all metals except gold will corrode with they try to form stable oxide compounds. So that's our corrosion process. Um, but the rate at which that happens depends upon the metal itself and the environment it's in. Now there's lots of guidance for design for, for what we might call inverted commas normal corrosion rates. In the design standards for marine structures, there are rates in millimetres per year per face for different exposure, buried structures, fully immersed structures, tidal zones, splash zone. These are, these are used by designers in terms of structural design to make a corrosion allowance for the life. So if a structure's got 25 year life, you have a rate of X millimeters per year in this zone, wherever the, the highest bending moment or shear loads are. So you need to make an allowance of the steel is at, at that thickness. Now those corrosion rates tend to be within that environment, relatively uniform. So you get that loss of section across a whole, you know, like a wide exposure area. Um, there is also some guidance in those codes of practice on more rapid localised corrosion rates. And this is, this is primarily what we're talking about this morning. So this phenomenon, accelerated low water corrosion. It's a, it's a little bit, it's now becoming a little bit of a misnomer. Although it's more prevalent at low water line, it has been seen, I've seen it in conditions where, it's, where the structure has been limited much, much higher in the water level and it's also been noted down to bed levels, not, not hugely deep bed level, not in a 20 metre draft sort of, sort of structure, but, but relative. And in an extreme case, this is what you can end up with, significant perforations along a line. It's not a whole plane, haven't lost the whole thing. This is actually a, a redundant structure, but this is an example of a sort of a worst case. It, untreated, this is what can happen. So obviously, perforation, particularly a problem if you've got a granular fill behind your wall, perforation, loss of fill, the concrete slab on top of that fill is then unsupported, and have been cases where um, key decks have dropped significantly because of loss of fill. So, accelerated low water corrosion, a bit of a background. Um, there's, there's lots of different processes that cause localised corrosion. Uh, accelerated low water corrosion that we're talking about is microbially. It's microbi microbially based corrosion or driven by. Um, there's been more and more reports of this since the early 80s, certainly in the UK. Uh, and it's been mostly observed just above lowest astronomical tide, LOT. There's been various research, uh, papers, and the quoted range it, within these papers for corrosion rates are anything between 0.3, the slightly more worrying, of up to four millimetres steel loss per annum. So if you've got a 12 mil thick, 20 mil thick sheet pile, that's 
three to five years. That's, I have to say, that is exceptional, but single digit millimetres per year has been seen in, in, in many locations. So at those sort of rates, you are going to get perforation and certainly loss of your structural, the design thickness in much more rapid periods than the, than the nominal structural design. Um, is it a new phenomenon? Has it always been there? The answer is, I don't think we really know. Uh, there's lots of um, speculation. Has it become more prevalent with international shipping? Has the, whatever the micro has been moved around in bilge water tanks from shipping? There's a lot of speculation, but I don't think, to be honest, I don't think we really know. But it's there, unquestionably, it is there. Um, again, influencing factors, there, are, there is a lot of research, uh, investigation into what exactly the cause is, where, where you may or may not find it. Uh, and one very, very good document covering this is the 2005 Siri report on accelerated low water growth, which gives a lot of good background information, investigation techniques, uh, uh, and gives some brief view of uh, possible approaches to, uh, to repair. So, identification of accelerated low water corrosion. Um, typically, what will be seen is a bright orange bloom on the surface, uh, which, is, which is a covering layer. So we have an orange deposit layer on the surface. If you scrape that away, and it really is very easy to scrape it away, just <coughs> literally wipe it off. Underneath you will find a black sulfide sludge layer, um, rotten egg sort of smell, and again, that's easily washed off, very easy. You get a glove with a bit of sea water, just wash it away, and underneath you will find very, very bright, shiny, clean steel. So this is, at, at that point, it's very easily identifiable from what we might term normal corrosion, which is hard, brown, you can't, you can't just brush it off. Underneath the black slime you will find bright, almost as new steel. And, and it's at this, these locations where we get this rapid pitting section loss. So it's not a, a you won't get it over the, initially over that whole area, but within that patch you will be getting dish, dishing, uh, pitting corrosion, but it's but very, very deep. So, where does it occur on, on structures? Again, within the Siri reports, various people's reports, there are different specu speculation that on some types of piles it occurs mainly on the outpans or the inpans. On some types of piles it appears mainly on the clutches. In my experience, it's much more varied than that. On a Larson pile, where we have the, the clutches uh, down the wall, rather than on the outpan or inpan. I've seen it on the inpans, on the clutches. It's, I think it, it, it's much more general than a specific with this type of pile it will occur in this location. Um, very, very identifiable in this band between LAT and mid-tide, which is the, the most prevalent level, but it does occur at other levels. Now, as I've said, on new piles, is it more prevalent on the outpans? I'm not sure. I think the key one, geographic location. As far as I'm concerned, and we've done projects, I've been all around the coast of the UK, south coast, western isles, north east Scotland. There is nowhere on the UK, there are no areas on the UK coastline where there isn't accelerated low water growth. And there may be individual structures, and I've been in ports where structures of similar age, that structure's got it, that structure hasn't. Why? I couldn't say, but generally it's everywhere around the coast. And the same in the, in the um, coast of northern France and, and anecdotally, you know, all across the world. This is not, you know, this is not our problem, but it's, uh, it's, it's expansive in terms of geographically where it occurs. So, Paul talked a little bit about Humphrey Davy, who first used galvanic anodes there. So, what, what, what I'm, what we, what we're selling, it's nothing new. This is, you know, this is, this is not some sort of new innovative technology, this is simple electrochemistry. 
Um, impressed current was first used. So the first, the first use was the galvanic anodes, as Paul said, the different metal properties. Uh, then impressed current used. And it's very well codified. There are standards, uh, BS 7361 from 1991 covered cathodic protection to all sorts of environments for steel in concrete steel, in soil steel, in seawater. More recently, and just recently revised, um, BS 13174, cathodic protection for harbour structures. It pretty much says, you know, does what it says on the tin. So it's a, it's, a, it's a guideline for design and specification for cathodic protection in harbour structures. More commonly used prior to that, and still used today, this is a, a Norwegian DNV, Deknos Veritas, is a recommended practice for design of cathodic protections that was primarily driven by the offshore oil and gas industry and has some more stringent criteria than, than, this, than this document. There are some conflicts between the two, but they're, you know, they're, they're both very, very good uh, uh, documents for design process. So it's well established, it's, it's proven the oil and gas industry have been using cathodic protection to, prevent, to protect their uh, more often in press to protect their marine structures for, for a very, very long time. Um, and in many cases it's mandated. Um, and as I'll come on to later, reinforced concrete structures, it's common in marine structures because the environment, all that chloride from the sea or from splash atmosphere, so you get a very, very corrosive environment. So how can we how can we prevent that? Well the answer, or one answer, is cathodic protection. And as Paul said, there's two, two general principles of cathodic protection, and I'm going to look now at those two, just, uh, just those two principles. So the galvanic anodes, if we're protecting a steel in seawater structure, we, would, we have an anode, typically an aluminium alloy or a zinc alloy. It's connected by a bracket or a steel core. Could be a cable, but generally not. Directly to the pile we're trying to, to protect we're in the seawater, so that's our electrolyte. So that's our, that's our corrosion cell where the anode is corrosing to protect the structure. So that's the galvanic anode approach. Uh, the impressed current approach, very, very similar. Anode in the water, but this will be a dimensionally stable anode, probably a titanium. Uh, there are some other products connected to a DC power supply, connected to the pile, similar reactions, protect the pile. So they're the two, the two general approaches. So I'm now going to just look at where we might use one or the other, pros and cons. Uh, so we'll start with galvanic anodes. They're simple. That's the, 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 main, the main advantage. It's simple. You are attaching a lump of a metal anode directly to the structure you're protecting. Generally, there are no other components. That's the lot. It's an anode and a protected structure. So I've there's, there's no need for an external power supply, so there's no electricity bill. So in terms of the, the client's ongoing costs, he has not, he's not got an annual cost for electrical consumption. Although it has to be said, he's paid for that electricity in the converting of the aluminium alloy from, a, from bauxite into aluminium and in the foundry and cast. So all that energy, going back to Paul again, and, and the energy's been already been used up uh, to make the anodes. So the client's paying for that in the material, but he's not paying for it over the life. So you're, looking, you're always looking at life costs. There's no cabling. Typically, there's no cabling, so uh, it's, there's none of the vulnerabilities that you can get with cabling. So it's a simple system, so there's less to go wrong. Um, it pretty much looks after itself because it's, it's, it's chemistry. It does, it does what it naturally does, so there's, there's less to inspect and monitor. But the, it still does. Some people push the case for galvanic anodes in that it's a fit and forget, uh, once it's on it works, but, but it, it still needs to be monitored and inspected because if, if a ship wipes out half your anodes and you're not inspecting it you won't notice until possibly your key starts to drop because you've lost all your fill. So. so I only noticed this when I was reviewing this last night, this is probably somewhere pretty close to here, I just spotted that in the background <laughs> last night. So. Um, and maybe the, the naval vessel was probably a bigger giveaway, actually. But uh, this is a typical aluminium, zinc, indium anode. Uh, I can tell there it's, it's quite a large one. It's 155 kilos uh, on a, cast onto a steel core. 
that core will be connected to a bracket and welded or bolted onto the structure. Um, in terms of sheet piles, there's some different sizes, so we may have different depths or different configurations of structure. Um, in terms of sheet piles, typically for a continuous sheet pile wall, we would have, this is a photograph at, at very low water, because ideally these would be fully immersed at all times, but we will have one anode every in-pan along the structure, because there's a limited distance to which these can push current. So if, if we had an anode there and, and neither of these, we would probably have protection only sort of into the next uh, the next in pan and then the protection will drop off. So it, we're having so if you've got a very long wall, it's a lot of individual fitments, you know, because the a typical in pan spacing would be 1.8 to 1.2, one and a half meters. So so regularly along a wall. Um, this is a relatively shallow structure here, so um, there's only a single line of anodes, but if you have a very, very deep structure, you may, have, you may have a secondary line of anodes further down to give us the vertical distribution of currents. We're protecting the whole, the whole area. This is, um, these are all individual anodes on a steel frame. These would have been fitted individually. So each, in, each individual anode is fitted by a dive team as a separate operation. Here, this is a much deeper draft structure with uh, quite a large overhang. It's a combi wall, so it's a tubular pile with uh, a sheet pile section in between, with a, with a large overhang and fendering system, so we have, we have a working space to, uh, to fit the anodes. Back to here, these anodes will be installed so they're, they're, the line of the front of the anode is behind the implants. So if you've got a berthing vessel, they're not going to get damaged. Here, because they've got a, a large overhang and a fendering system, we can fit multiple anodes in one, uh, in one installation process. It's a very deep draft, so we need lots and lots of anodes. And the, uh, the installing contractor came up with a novel access method. So the, the frames have been swung in, they're bolted at the top, and then the dive, the dive team will go down and secure the, the anodes at the bottom. <coughs> so, so it's a, it's a sim relatively simple process, galvanic anodes. Uh, we can install it on all sorts of different geometries. The, the, the big limitation is life. Typically, we don't design for beyond 25 years. Theoretically, you can design for any length you like, but the mass of the anode is pro rata to the life you require. And it get beyond 25, 20, 25 years, typically the anodes get so massive, the required anodes, but you haven't got the physical space to install them. So if we look uh, now in impressed current. So we, with impressed current, because the anodes are basically inert, they don't, they don't, they do have a coating on that consumes, but they can be, the, the, the anode tube itself will not consume. We can have much, much longer lives, 50 years plus. So we have a much longer life system Typically, for a new build structure, and I stress that, um, the capital cost of the installation project will be much less than a galvanic anode system because you have much fewer anode fitments. Each one of these impressed current anodes can kick out a lot more current so you can, you can protect with an individual anode a much larger area. The reason I stress new build, if it's a new build structure, there's cabling involved, and this is one of the big trade-offs with the, the galvanic system. The cabling needs to be managed. If you've got a working port that's an existing structure, you've got crane rails, cranes running like you imagine trying to fit something and then manage that cable around the structure in a, in a, in a manner that's going to secure it. If you're going to do that as a retrofit, you're going to spend an awful lot of money on cable protection. If it's new build, you can plan ducting into the concrete copes, the capping, so all your cabling can be, can be easily managed. Um, it's controllable in that we have a power supply so we can measure the performance very easily against the, sta against the standards. We can do that with, with um, galvanic anodes, but because you have a power supply system here, you can have a remote monitor system with permanent monitoring method, mechanisms. Um, as I said, the, the principal one is there's, m there's many fewer anodes to install. 
typically one per 10, maybe even one per 20 in terms of a ratio to, uh, to the galvanic anode. And it's also more practical for uh, areas of higher resist resistivity of the seawater. If, if you're on the UK coast, we have a pretty uniform conductivity of the seawater. And it's, a, it's an important part of the design process. If your water is less conductive, the galvanic anodes will be less efficient. So you may need more, uh, not necessarily more weight, but uh, it's a function of the surface area of the anodes. They need to be more slender, or you, instead of having one short, stubby anode, you may need two long, thin ones of the same mass. But again, that, that impacts on your installation costs. Um, but if you get into estuarine areas, um, Estuarine, when you come into the Thames, uh, the Mersey, the Humber, many of these estuarine rivers, it's still, if, you, if you're into fully fresh water, the corrosion rates are much lower, but if you're into brackish water, you still can get corrosion, you still get ALWC, but the design presses are a little bit harder. Um, but because we can provide whatever power we want from the external power supply, we can overcome that problem within a press current system. Um, and often, because the anodes need to be fully submerged, if you have a high bed level, if you start burying galvanic anodes, they become much less efficient, but we can put the press current anodes buried, and again, they're less efficient, but we can overcome that with a with power supply. So, here's some anodes on the, on the key side before ins installation. This tube here is the anode itself, that's a coated titanium tube. It's in a GRP former, so that's gonna fit within the in-pan and in this case, there's a steel core going through the GRP, and these are welded directly to the steel pile. The reason for the, the GRP format is obviously there's a much higher output current, and we want to distribute that current away from just jumping directly to the, the nearby steel. That helps with the distribution of current to provide the protection over a wider area. But obviously, that's the issue, is the management of the cable. In this, in this case, the the structure had a concrete facing down to mid-tide and uh, there was a duct cast through the concrete facing so the anodes were installed at low water, steel conduit up to that concrete facing and then the cables were, were managed through. Uh, but they're very durable and they're lightweight so they're quite a lot easier for the, for the divers to install. So that's, uh, that's the same thing. So that's the steel core that's welded on, that runs right through. It's actually connected to the pins. And this is just bolted through a split bolt. So if there is any cable damage or failure of the anode, it can easily be replaced by the diver by just undoing the split bolts, taking it out, slotting in replacement rather than cutting off the whole installation. So these are for a sheet pile wall. These are similar for tubular piles. Within this plastic tube is, this, is a similar anode. You can't actually see on there, there's a, there's a window cut out of the plastic tube to work for the current to pass. Uh, this is just a st structural stiffener. But again, as I said, you need to manage the cabling. So this, this one was actually a retrofit because it was a brackish. It was, this was on the time. Um, so the cable did have to be managed. So there's cable suspended on the deck underneath. This was an overhang structure uh, managed back to the position of the, of the power supply. And there's a typical power supply unit, maybe in a plant room nearby, or on the quayside, providing that you get used as a temporary bollard by the control of them, which sometimes happens, so that has to be considered. Um, time. Does it work? Does CP prevent accelerated low water corrosion? Absolutely. Yes, it does. There's plenty of research out there that will, that will tell you it does, um, but the, the best way is the, the visual evidence. There's a typical ALWC patch. This is after the installation of the CP, what you'll find is you'll tend to find the orange disappears and you end up with a not clean steel but an area of exposed steel without a, the biofouling and it's cleaned up quite nicely and as Paul said earlier, calcareous deposits, so this is about three months after the installation of the system, you can't see the anodes because it's a high water shot um, and that's evidence again, steel's all nice and clean and you're getting a calcareous build up so uh, protection, but there's, there's plenty, don't take my word for it, read the research, there's plenty out there, cathodic <coughs> protection, it, it prevents the normal corrosion as well as the accelerated corrosion. 
just a note on where we can actually get protection, where protection is efficient. So there's our anode, installed on a wall, below low tide, so it's always, all around the tidal cycle, it's in the water, it's always passing current. Up to mid-tide, we say we get full protection, so if it's, if it's properly designed and maintained, up to that point, you will have, for all intents and purposes, no corrosion on that wall at all. Up to mid-tide is in the water more often than it's not, so you get a beneficial effect. Between mid-tide and high-tide, obviously it's atmospherically exposed more often than not, so when it's atmospherically exposed, there's no path for the current to get onto the structure, no protection. So in that area, we'll get some protection, a reduction of corrosion rate, but not a cessation. So we're often pushed, where, you know, where do I get protection? So to the design codes, I will say up to there, you get protection. Above that, if you're really going to push me, I will say you get nothing. Because it's very, very, very difficult to ascertain exactly what the reduction in corrosion rate will be. It depends on the tidal cycle, it depends on the design, but there is some benefit. But above, above high tide, in the atmosphere, no benefit from cathodic protection at all. And the other thing to stress, nothing on the back either. It's only the front face of the wall, but if you have anodes on the front face, you're only getting protection up because there's no path for the current to get through the wall and protect the back face. There's generally the back face of these sort of structures, it's, it's oxygen depleted, so the corrosion condition, the, the, the risk of corrosion is very, very low. So just uh, some typical examples, very, very large container port somewhere in the east of England, several kilometres of continuous sheet pile and combi wall and king, tubular king piles. It's all got galvanic anode cathodic protection on it. Lock gates, small sector lock gates. Uh, I know of three or four that I've been involved in, one with impressed current, two with galvanic anode on. Uh, interesting design because you've got some vagaries of water levels if you've got a contained basin on one side, but, uh, but the, the general principles apply. Discrete structures, individual steel legs, again, easy, uh, cathodic protection easily applied. Uh, and that's a thing appear with wave screens, but each one of the uh, 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 piles on here has got galvanic anodes on protecting. So, which do we choose? In summary, most UK ports, small ports, fishing harbours, or even large ports, if you're retrofitting, galvanic anodes is most likely to be the most cost effective. In, in press current comes into its own for new build structures if you're taking that approach, particularly if it's combined with a coating coatings as well, because coatings reduces the current demand and the extent of the design. Or if, you, if it's a very, very large, extensive, long life uh, structural upgrade, it could, could have advantages there. Uh, and again, the impressed current, estuarine ports, high water resistivity, or shallow water depths. I will run through this fairly briefly because I know I'm coming close on time. So, CPO steel and concrete in marine structures, chloride ingress from the seawater, salt spray. As was explained earlier, the chloride gets into the, to the concrete, breaks down the passive layer, and corrosion commences. Uh, and what we're trying to stop is that. So this is obviously a very, very extreme example. Clients don't usually leave it this late, but uh, <laughs> here we've had a situation where something's been repaired previously. Unfortunately, that sets up a condition where you have this becomes cathodic, this bit of concrete becomes anodic, and you get what we call the incipient anode effect. So you get more rapid corrosion next to your repairs. So this has been one repair. Within five years, they're coming back and doing another repair. So and maybe a more extensive approach next time. Um, I think some of the other presenters will, will talk about different types of anode systems for cathodic protection, one of which being conductive coatings, not particularly suitable for, for an aggressive marine environment. Um, other, other systems, cementitious overlays, mesh, 
overlay, discrete anode for ribbon anodes. Paul mentioned these two earlier. Um, some reinforced concrete marine structures that have got cathodic protection on. Fourth bridge, bridge piers here. Uh, recently had cathodic protection on the approach piers. Also happens to have immersed seawater compressed current on the uh, protection for the tower. So it's structured with both. This is uh, just off the Liffey in Dublin. This was a nice new development and the architectural vision that it would rise out of the water. This is an old dock. So underneath there, when you drain the dock, there are lots of concrete legs. The original architectural plan was this was all going to be fresh water with lots of nice fish swimming around it. Somebody worked out how much that was going to cost and went, it's just over the lock gates to the lift. That's seawater. Under there, these nice new concrete, dry concrete columns sucked up all that seawater and within five years of this structure being built, it had significant corrosion problems on those concrete legs. Uh, and again, that's had an impressed current system on it. Here, uh, coastal promenade, concrete columns. This is actually a GRP former. It's mesh anode inside it. So just different applications, different sort of structures. This is an historic, historic structure. Masonry clad steel next to the sea. Cathodic protection in these beams. In the Middle East, typically, more often in the Middle East, because uh, the corrosion rate is particularly high with higher uh, temperatures, they often used impressed current in reinforced concrete from new build. So this is ribbon on plastic spaces, so it doesn't contact and short circuit to the mesh. So this is a whole anode system attached to the reinforcement before the concrete's cast. So that they can, rather than stop corrosion that has started, they can prevent the initiation of corrosion. So corrosion doesn't even begin on these structures. Uh, very, very quickly run through this. Uh, UK 1960s jetty that was being refurbed for a new use. It's a kilometre long approach viaduct and then various berthing structures. These concrete structures were to be kept. The deck was completely removed and rebuilt. Individual houses for the, for the work to be gone on. There was also uh, steel tubular piles to be protected all of which has got cathodic protection. The reinforced concrete was done with a mesh system. So there's all the mesh fitted with the cables for the various connection, negative system, positive system, monitoring probes. And that has a 25 mil spray concrete overlay applied to that. So that's in the process of being sprayed. So this cross beam there. So there's different exposures. So we apply different currents for different exposures. So within each one of these stru individual structures, of which there are approximately 100, they were split into independently controlled zones. This is fully atmospheric. This is the splash zone. And this is within the tidal zone. So they're controlled differently because they have different corrosion characteristics. And one of the earlier pictures of the impressed current anodes, you can see all, you can't actually see the anodes, but you can see all the cabling on all the steel piles were impressed current anodes to protect the steel piles from corroding below the seawater. They did have to paint the, uh, the atmospheric section as well. And as, as I mentioned earlier, power supply systems all linked to a, a local area network and then we can dial into this and monitor the system through a, through a dial-in modem. And that is one of the power supplies and there's, there's 10 on the overall structure. New build, so, and then there were also new build structures. So we've got new build steel piles next to existing steel piles. So these also have impressed current cathodic protection. Uh, that's just an example of the, the data screens from the, the uh, control system. And now in operation. Fairly large. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, cathodic protection is a very, very useful tool to prevent corrosion in uh, marine environments. There's a very ex existing track record for cathodic protection, primarily using galvanic anodes to prevent ALWC, but the press current system has its uses. Um, 
often used for new build structures, uh, brackish water, and as everything, everything about this organisation really is out there, there is a, it's widely used to prevent uh, corrosion of reinforced concrete structures, but there's just some examples of it used in a, in a, in a marine environment rather than maybe a high-weight environment. Uh, but just, just, just a sh short note there, and I, and I know there's a couple of the uh, exhibitors here who uh, deal with this, but they're also increasingly using galvanic anode systems within reinforced concrete structures as a new, more novel or a, or a different approach. I think others will cover that in more detail. Thank you very much.